Okay, we're using their spare legs. Exactly. Oh, okay. You know, that might make an ass out of you. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure the Bay Area stats... Well, what happens when you say, I, I presume, Pre then you make a... Presume instead of assume? Yeah. Welcome to the Best of Investing. I'm Edward Brown, your host. Here's our format. A bunch of guys sitting around a bar. There's no bar. Having drinks. There's no drinks either. But we're talking business, and you, the audience, are listening in. The Best of Investing is actually a radio show that has been around since August 2010, and it airs every Saturday on Fox News Radio, 9, 10 a.m. at 1 p.m. Now, we're not a political show. We're strictly business, so everyone will be happy with that. Remember, I'm Edward Brown, wishing you the best of investing. Are you ready? Let's go. Welcome! You're listening to the best of investing on Fox News Radio, 9, 10 a.m. You know the show. It's where we present valuable information about real estate, the financial markets, and other economic business of the day. For those of you listening for the first time, here is our format. A few guys sitting around a bar having drinks without the drinks, talking business with you, the audience, listening in. I'm your host, Edward Brown, and I'm honored to have as my partners in crime, Mark Hoff of Pacific Private Money, California's premier private lender, and Brian of Praxis Capital. Our phone number is 888-912-1190. Write that, num write that number down, 888-912-1190. Use that number to answer the trivia questions for three vacations given away during each commercial break. That's right, we're giving away nine vacations during this show. The vacations are sponsored by Lighthouse Resort and Marina, located one hour northeast of San Francisco. And the vacations are free. Their only request is a $75 cleaning fee to cover housekeeping expenses. Their website is lighthouse the number 4 fun.com. You can reach them at 916-777-5511. Check them out. And today's trivia theme is famous people named Mark. Now, oh, sorry, I, I don't know those. <laughs> now, sorry Brian, uh, maybe next week we'll have the famous uh, people named Brian, uh, all two of them. Uh, yeah, I, exactly. I can't think of them Brian. Right Not too many of them. Not okay. Many. Our website is bestofinvesting.com. Check us out on Facebook and YouTube by typing Best of Investing Radio Show. Also, if you want to record our show in the future, go to dar.fm, type in The Best of Investing, and listen to our show at your leisure. And today, we have a couple of special guests. I've known Miriam McCarthy for a number of years, and her partner in crime is Kathy Youngling. <laughs> And uh, I'm going to just give a quick little synopsis here. They are members of the Top Agent Network, which is the top 125 agents in Marin. And uh, Kathy is a senior real estate specialist and ePro agent and holds her broker's license. Kathy is also known uh, as being creative and a savvy marketeer. And Miriam Noel McCarthy, and that's Miriam with a Y, attended the Parsons School of Design in New York City and she's a, she calls herself a contradiction between creative visionary and analyst strategist. Uh, the, their team includes uh, stagers, painters, uh, pest control inspectors, uh, contractors, attorneys, landscapers, etc. Uh, ladies, welcome to the Best of Investing. Thanks. We're glad to be here. Okay. Thank you. All right. Now, let's get it right into uh, the special. First of all, Miriam. As I remember, you were a you were a former runway model in New York City and movie production. Yeah, that's correct. That was years ago. Uh, that years ago. <laughs> now you still look good. Now the audience doesn't know what you look like, so give them your Facebook page so they can see what you look like. Oh boy. <laughs> okay, you can go to Miriam Noel McCarthy. It's Miriam with a Y, M Y R I A M, and um, I've stepped a long way. It's been a long time since I've been a model. So. Uh, okay. All right. Do you have uh, a lot of fans on your page, Miriam? I wouldn't call them fans, more like friends. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's still kind of the same way. Well, friend her on Facebook. Okay, now tell us what can a good agent do for a seller, such as being quarterback of the team, you know, with the stagers and painters? Well, I'll tell you, if you don't have an agent in charge of that marketing technique, you're going to really be missing the boat. Because you've got a very sophisticated market here in Marin where we expect homes to look perfect. And if you walk in and your house isn't looking perfect, you're going to be the one who doesn't sell it. So we've got a pretty good thing going here that Miriam's got the design eye and we've got lots of experience in knowing what buyers are looking for. Now, Kathy, you say that for, for in, in Marin, you, you make that reference because, of course, you're, you're specialists in the Marin real estate market. But I can tell you as someone who makes loans to real estate rehabbers and flippers all over the Bay Area, that's important everywhere. 
Um, uh, maybe talk yeah. a little bit about how important staging is to actually getting a home sale in this market where uh, so some of the buyers are fewer and further between. You're right. And, and you're right about staging being beyond here, but there are still some markets where you don't see it as much, like in Sacramento County. You know, that's one where they're just starting to learn staging. But what we've learned in the more immediate Bay Area is that when it's such a competitive market, if your home looks old and tired and you walk in and you see everybody else's stuff around there instead of right. seeing yourself in there, then it's harder to make that mental commitment to that home. And also it, it decreases its sense of value. And um, Miriam, don't you think that over time people realize that a home that really looks good and shows well from the beginning speaks to the value of that home? For sure. It will sell in less time and for a lot more money than an unstaged home. Buyers these days walk into a house in about probably the first five minutes to decide whether they want to buy it or not. So visually appealing is very important. Yeah, I've definitely seen that where, you know, a, a buyer will make up its mind, their mind, before they put their hands on the doorknob. And we've noticed the same thing, you know, we buy, fix, and resell a lot of houses ourselves and uh, we, we've staged in some areas and some areas we haven't staged and I think uh, we see the houses that we've staged in, in the areas where we do staging to, to sell faster and at a little bit higher price point. And especially in the upper price tier, the more expensive the house, the more important it is to stage it. The very, very low price tier, maybe they overlook some of those kinds of things. Yeah, when we sold our house uh, on Las Colinas, we had it staged. And yeah. we were convinced that you know the, uh, the price paid for the staging would more than compensate for the fact of, of time is money. And it was funny, but we had, my uh, daughter was young and we went to the house one time after it had been staged just kind of see what was going on. And I mean, I personally didn't like it, but it wasn't my decision. It's the, it's the yeah. realtor's decision, right? Yeah. So anyway, we go to the bathroom, the kid's bathroom, and for some reason, they decided to change the wallpaper, do all this stuff, put a bunch of ducks, right? And my <laughs> daughter, for whatever reason, she goes, Daddy, they ducked up my bathroom. It's all ducked up. <laughs> That's funny. Well, and, and isn't it true that, you know, I know some homeowners might think, well, well I've got nice furniture, so I'll just leave my furniture mm -hmm. in. But isn't one of the tricks of staging is it, it's actually not truly livable. Generally, you walk in and it's not the way normal people would live, the way it's staged, but it people does say something. nobody lives it's here. Again, it's marketing. It's a, it's a technique. Yeah. Isn't that true? Yeah. It's totally true. You want the buyer to see themselves in that home. I can give you a perfect example. I had a listing, a pretty high-end home, and it was a beautiful, very modern home where there were seamless glass windows with a view of the Golden Gate National Recreation Area. Mm. Just stunningly beautiful, but very modern. The people that own that home like French provincial things, you know, so there are little angel heads on the wall and flowers here and and it just didn't go. I mean, you walked in there and not only did you not see yourself in this home, but you couldn't see the house. Mm, yeah, and, and, and I've, house I've looked at that too, where yeah. I mean, I've looked at staging, um, again, for our own house, and I said, you know what, i got to get my emotions, my taste totally out of it because I'm not the buyer. I mean, if purple That's, sells, then you paint the house purple. Right, and purple doesn't often sell, by the way. And this house had a lot of, <laughs> had a lot of pink and purple in it. Mm. So what we did finally was to convince the people that even though they love their things, we had to get those things out of there. And we had been on the market for, I don't know, a couple months, and it wasn't selling for those reasons. And when we went in there and neutralized the home and brought in more modern elements to really show the style of that house, we sold it in a week. Okay. So, all right, people, we are going to go to our first commercial break. We're in the studio here with the following. Mark Hahn, Pacific Private Money, my yes, co-host. Brian Burke, Practice Capital, my co-host. And the two lovely ladies, Kathy Youngling and Miriam Noel McCarthy, who are specialists in their areas. And we're going to get into other areas uh, which you help so, okay. Brian, you're going to ask a, an excellent question. Yeah, you know, uh, usually when you hear people talking about hiring a real estate agent to sell their property, they're talking in the singular sense and hiring one real estate agent. I understand that you guys work together as a team, so I'm curious, what's the benefit of hiring a team to help me sell my property versus hiring an individual agent, and does that cost double? Well, you might do everything just perfectly well, but most of us <laughs> are better in some things than others. And with having somebody else next to you that kind of fills in the gaps, that's one thing that's great about it. But it's just time-wise, too. I mean, you can't be everywhere at the same time. I was a single agent for a very long time before Miriam joined me a couple of years ago. And the quality of what I give to my clients is exponentially higher and better. 
and the availability is just gigantic. People tend to underestimate how much work goes into selling a house, really? don't they? So there, there really? is a, a lot of time involved <laughs> in there. <laughs> There's a lot of things that comes into play. I mean, you can't have be a great designer and be a great analysis and be a great negotiator and have the vision and do the photography. You can't have, not one person has all these skills. Oh, and I was pretty good at it though. Man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she concept. was. She was very good at it, but it's even better now. Yeah, that's so, right. And so Kathy and I are totally the yin and the yang, and we uh, debate all the time mm -hmm. on price and this. What do you mean? Do we really debate? I don't know. Yes, yeah, I want somebody yeah, fighting over how to sell my house. That actually <laughs> funny, right? And we can come up with all sorts of different strategy and really see a whole different new picture. It's got a really hard brainstorm really by well. yourself, I guess. Our clients yeah, have been true. very happy. <laughs> so, okay, I got a hard question for you. Good. All right, what about hiring an agent on an hourly basis and doing a FISBO, which stands for for sale by owner, and cut you guys right out of it? Mm. <laughs> well, <laughs> then you, what you'll do is you'll you'll try for a while and then you'll call me because <laughs> I've certainly had that happen before. Um, one guy that I can think of tried that three times in a row and then <laughs> three times in a row and then he finally called me and then we put this house on the market and we had it sold within a month. So you know, he said, "Well, that was stupid of me to do. Why is it stupid?" Well. You, you know how this world is right now. There's a new disclosure every time you turn around. There's been a lawsuit, somebody gets sued for something, there's a new form. Do you know that as a seller of your home on your own? Do you know what forms are required? Will you be sued later on because you didn't? Well, can I add something here? I Personally, I, and it's funny, I had a friend of mine, um, actually it was a friend of my dad's years ago, and he said, you know what, the agent's commission is the cheapest commission you'll ever pay. And uh, to me, uh, here, here's that's the... That's true. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> well, here, here's, here to me, this is the easiest way to, to figure this out. As a true buyer, the first thing they do when they say, oh, it's a for sale by owner, well, you're not paying a commission, so yep. they automatically lower, lower the price by right. the commission right. anyway. That's free lunch. Right. Yeah. 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 They're going to do that every time. So how do you how can you get a hold of you? Besides going on Miriam's personal <laughs> Facebook page. I bet our personal website is realmarindal.com. And you can also Google Kathy and Miriam, and you'll find us that way. Kathy yeah. and Miriam with a Y as well. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Welcome, you're listening to the best of investing on News Talk 910. You know our show, it's where we present valuable information about real estate, the financial markets, and other economic business of the day. I'm your host, Edward Brown, and I'm pleased to have as my co-host Mark Hahn of Pacific Private Money, California's fastest growing private lender, Robert Schiff of RPM Mortgage, and Lou Botlaw of Linsco Private Ledger. And our phone number is 888-912-1190. Write that number down, 888-912-1190, because you're going to use that number to answer the trivia questions for three vacations given away during each commercial break. That's right, we're giving away nine vacations during this show. The vacations are sponsored by Lighthouse Resort and Marina, which is located one hour northeast of San Francisco. The vacations are free. Their only request, a $75 cleaning fee to cover housekeeping expenses. Their website is lighthouseforfun.com. Check them out. You can reach them at 916-777-5511. And today's trivia theme, da -da 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 drum roll, is injuries in sports. That'll be kind of fun. Yeah. A little hurtful, but that's okay. Our website is bestofinvesting.com. Check us out on Facebook and YouTube by typing Best of Investing Radio Show. And we're also on television, Comcast Channel 26 on Saturdays at noon. And if you're listening to the radio, you just missed an hour's worth of TV of us. And some days at 6 p.m. you can catch us there. And uh, today, Lou, is, why don't you start us off with what's going on in the stock market? Well, um, I, I wanted to dig in real quick as we, we've hit the uh, July time frame where we kind of take a deep breath and measure what's happened this year so far in the marketplace, uh, specifically you know, what the returns have been and, and really where we're headed. Um, it's an election year, which is always a fun, fun year because uh, in the end, uh, it really, we kind of hit a pause button between now and uh, November trying to figure out what's going to happen. Uh, there is a physical cliff we'll talk about uh, coming up, but uh, I want to comment on a few quick things. One is, um, if you look at the just the S&P 500 this year, uh, we're up close to 9%, 8.9%, 6 as of June 30th of this year, which is a real nice return. I take that any day, any week, any month of the year. It's actually been a really good start to the year. We kind of had that very bad August last year, remember, where we're arguing over the debt ceiling and all those things. and from that point forward, things really moved forward, you know, moved ahead with the uh, August time frame going to September, October, but really ramped up December, uh, January, February, March. March we kind of peaked. We've come down since then. So, what happened though? We since 
June of June thirtieth. June, June 30th is the, is the mark of the six months. Yeah. No, no, yeah. I know what that is. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, <laughs> yeah I, I, like I said, I've always had six years of high school. So, um, okay. No, what I meant was uh, from June, let's say July 1st to now. The fiscal, I know the market's fiscal up year. Quite a bit. Yeah. Well, no, no, no. Just wondering, how's the market done just in, in July so far? In oh, July so far, oh, it's yeah. uh, well. As of this week, it's it's about flat for the for the month of July. Oh, okay. Because we so, had some six down sessions. But, right. Uh, we're, today, we're up today. We're, we're up. Uh, should I say this week? Um, on Friday, we hit about two hundred point upturn during okay. interday trading. Uh, the market's probably going to close. I think between one thirty, one seventy to today. So. Now it used to be in the old days that the market was about eighteen months ahead of the economy. But I know it's, it's all, everything's really? changed. Was, it, mean, that, was, was it that long? Yeah, wow. about sixty in the sixties wow. and seventies and eighties and nineties. And <laughs> now it's about five it? minutes ahead. <laughs> <Yeah. right now. laughs> well, it changes so much. Yeah, yeah. It, it's a, it's a futures game. Everyone's trying yeah. to price where things are going. We got some good news and bad news every single week. You know, unemployment came out last week, which was very negative. Uh, consumer sentiment came out this week, which is not very positive. Um, and the reason why people are not feeling good right now is because we're up almost twelve percent for the year. In March, and we dropped about two and a half percent. So that March to June thirtieth time frame was very negative. Okay, well remember, this is the happy show, so we only like to hear good news. <laughs> keep, keep, keep the bad news. <laughs> the bad news. So what's the good news for stock investors? Yeah. Uh, the yeah. good, well, the good news is everyone's still getting paid dividends, and, and the rate of return on dividend-paying stocks has been quite high. And it's um, still actually, in dollars. It's still in dollars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, no, I mean, that, that that stretches another question, which is, you know, what's going on over in Europe and uh, China? China this week was in a uh, real crosshairs of everyone talking about their GDP report, which is not very positive. And if it, it's kind of this trickle down effect, that's what we have to remember now is that we we are interdependent, like we were 20 years ago, like yeah. you mentioned. And you know, if China's not buying stuff from Germany and Germany's not buying stuff from us, and we're not buying stuff from China, it kind of circulates around the globe, and you kind of have this general slowdown. That's we, that's why they bought the Olympic clothes from China. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like when you buy a, a toy. It's not a Japanese car anymore, 100%. I mean, it's right. uh, Tennessee. Yeah. yeah, yeah, a lot of it's uh, American China. made. Yeah, no, it, it, that, you know, that's, hopefully we can build up some more manufacturing because really what we are right now is a service and consumer economy. And uh, many say those are the stocks to hold through this election period. Um, I had one interesting thing I wanted to throw out there about the uh, Wall Street election poll that LPL put out. This is kind of interesting because they said there's certain industries you guys will love this, will be affected by the election one way or another. If Democrats take over, Republicans take over. <coughs> Who's elected president? Who controls the Senate and the House? Uh, so they came back with Democrats. They favor health care facilities, obviously. Of course. Food and staples, uh, retailing, gas, utilities, health care services, life science tools and services, construction materials, home building, construction, and farm and machinery. Now, what's left? That's the Republican <laughs> side. Uh, let's see, gambling casinos and... Well, it, it, oh, this, sure. That's this depressing was, already. Well, it, it's kind of, it's this counterintuitive balance between, uh, you know, what people support and, you know, you get this ethanol and natural gas debate and all those things. So when you get to the Republican side, it's cold and consumable fuels, drill, baby, drill, diversified <laughs> financial services, banks too big to fail, sure. oil and gas exploration and production, uh, oil and gas drilling, I'd probably include fracking in that as well. We can't actually buy fracking. You can buy companies that frack. Managed healthcare, electric utilities, specialty retailers, because if taxes don't go up, you can put your money somewhere, and that's with the larger uh, base retail chains that have a high price point. And then telecommunications and services. So what, what people are starting to do is trying to define where they think the economy is going based on tax policy. Well, you know, that, I don't know that I believe that. I mean, why would retail favor the Democrats if retail is based on the economy and and generally speaking I think are, are Republican policies more Fiscal. pro entrepreneurial um, business growth business development business investment hiring all of those well th that's a, a great point because the real struggle right now is who's gonna get the money you, you always got to follow the money in the economy right yeah. and what they're really saying like like uh, President Barack Obama said this week, I'm not going to raise taxes on those earning under $250,000. So, well, the, but the idea is that those who are <laughs> spending money at Walmart, Target, or other retail chains that have a lower price point are going to be okay versus a high end retailer like, but, you know, we think Nord of Nordstrom's or yeah. Tiffany or others won't do quite as well. So, Tommy Bahama. Tommy Bahama. <laughs> nice clothes. I love the their shirts, but they're too expensive. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, the idea here is that we really need to focus on, um, you know, not only the issue of who's going to be elected, Democrats or Republicans, but also 
uh, the end result of this fiscal cliff, which is you know how we're going to pay all this debt service off, uh, because it's going to be a problem possibly in November. That could be really captivating. We could have the election and then have to go through that debate went through last August, and then almost all the tax cuts expire. And we talked about that this week. I mean, I talked to some clients and say, what if dividends are taxed ordinary income? That's a big what if. That's and a that possibility. Could, that is a possibility right now. I mean, if you go back to the the Bush tax cuts, that's one of the things they lowered, which is a great thing in my opinion for. Uh, especially you know older investors who want to clip coupons and sure. get paid income stream but boom here we are with this this could be ordinary income and then everyone's like what do we do what's well, like we always talked about trying to overhaul the tax system where they say well get rid of the income tax and just have a national sales tax you know but the problem with that is that you know you have to make it high enough to, to make it worthwhile and then you're gonna scrunch um, uh, quash, I guess is a better word. Consumption. Uh, consumption, yeah. yeah. Because people right. say, I can't afford that car. They're going to add an extra 10%. And think of all the people that would suddenly be unemployed if you had no accountants to follow, try to but tax that's accountants. That's, and that's true. We don't care about the IRS yeah. auditors, yeah. I know. But here's the other side. thing, too. It's not a progressive the, On thing, the defense right? side. Right. I mean, I guess in theory, what they could do is if you purchase you know, a higher priced you know, anything over 50000 gets a higher... Pro well, here, I don't well know. they did that with boats and cars a few years ago. Remember that? <laughs> yeah, oh, that's right, the luxury tax, tax, tax yeah, yeah, which was kind of yeah. brutal, but... It was know, brutal. Yeah, but... Val it washed the industry. It did, and, and VAT, VAT taxes, which they have over in Europe, are, are a great policy um, if your system are incorporated, but going from our system now into a VAT tax system could be really disruptive to many, many things. Okay, guys, we're going to uh, hit a quick commercial break here. Uh, before we go to the first quick trivia question, guess what? We're going to have another special trivia question. Look at that. Listen next and week. win. Not this week, but next oh, week. Oh, next week? Okay. Next week, yeah. Right, okay, we are going to go to our first commercial break. And remember, the theme is sports injuries. Here is the first trivia question. Who was the Oakland A's catcher that Pete Rose barreled over in an all-star game, separating his right shoulder? The first three callers with the correct answer win a free three-day, two-night stay at the Lighthouse Resort. Their website is lighthouseforfun.com. Call 888-912-1190. That's 888-912-1190 to answer this question. Who was the Oakland A's catcher that Pete Rose barreled over in an all-star game, separating his right shoulder? 888-912-1190. Make sure to include your name, email address, and remember to speak slowly and spell out your uh, email for us one letter at a time. And people people are who's not that's. So it's who was the person who Pete Rose barreled over. All right. 888-912-1190. We'll be right back. <laughs> who did? Who, who did? Who did? Who did? Who did? I know, actually, I don't know that. It's Fossey. Oh, Ray Fossey. Oh, wow. Very good. Fossey, yeah. I think I was going to take the Democrats. It says here, you take the Democrats and divide it by the Republican companies. What this, the market's telling you right now is Barack Obama is starting to gain momentum. It's falling off a little bit. This is from July 5th. Welcome back to The Best of Investing. I'm Edward Brown, your host, along with Mark Hunt, Robert Schiff. And Lou Blumall. The gang's all here. The gang's yes. all here. Hey. Okay, when we cut to the first commercial break, we asked this trivia question. And again, the theme is injuries in sports. Who was the Oakland A's catcher Pete Rose barreled over in the All-Star game, separating his right shoulder? A little hint, that was 1970, I believe. Lou, you knew the answer. I think it was Ray Fossey. It is Ray Fossey. That is correct. I think it was the first colorized All-Star game, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, was it really? <laughs> I think, yeah, pretty close. Yeah. There's yeah. some useless trivia. Yeah, yeah. yeah. totally <laughs> Okay, uh, Lou, uh, you were going to get into some information that was interesting about LIBOR. Well, it, you know, the, the last couple of weeks we've been berated with lots of different information. The, the index is coming out, the, the Fed speak, and all those things. But two huge issues have really affected the market. Uh, the main thing being this LIBOR scandal that we're just starting to understand. And I, I know people here uh, talk a lot about real estate, work in the mortgage industry, so everyone needs to chime in. But this is heresy, as far as I'm concerned. This uh, is the so what actually they, happened? They've changed the spelling from L-I-B-O-R to L-I-E-B-O-R. <laughs> Lie for. <laughs> well, I mean, these guys. I mean, the, as you guys know, the Fed, the Fed sets the Fed funds rate. Right. And over there, LIBOR is set by the interbank rate, and they actually discuss about how much they were going to charge each other and trying to help each other's out. Mm -hmm. um, each banker was calling each other. They have emails tracking back, like. What should we say that this week? Especially during 2008, there's a lot of this going on because everyone was so nervous. Lou, I'm sure it's all on the up and up. Come on. <laughs> well, they were just checking. Just <laughs> checking. Yeah. Right. Fact checking. So, I mean. They call it price fixing? 
I, well, I think it's, it's interest rate fixing. Yeah. And uh, in, in the end, there's so many things that are impacted by LIBOR. I think we know every single day. Yeah, a lot of loans. I, oh, credit cards. You know, everyone likes that rate because it's the most nimble of all the rates. It's not really set by anybody. Wait, wait, so if I have a loan that's uh, based on LIBOR, do I have any recourse to anybody on anything? I wonder. We don't know yet. Uh, We're researching. I mean, I know. Well, Lou, you said everyone. I think so, although I saw in the news this morning the mayor of Baltimore is right. going to file a lawsuit because she said they had money in accounts and the interest rate was based on the LIBOR. And she figured if it wasn't fixed, they would have earned more money right. in Baltimore. Well, okay, then as a, as a borrower, that's, I don't want to hear that answer. I don't so, want them to come back to me and go, you owe more oh, money. No, no, no. no. Well, you, your contract is set, so your okay. interest well, rate is set. So well, at LIBOR plus, but. Yeah, so Luke, question on when you, you mentioned that uh, certain people like LIBOR. Now, is it the lenders that like LIBOR or borrowers that like it's LIBOR? Borrowers. I, no, I think it's actually, well, it used to be borrowers. Now it's lenders. Oh, because when okay. the bank rate, when the rates are going down, you want to be in LIBOR because that would move with the market. And if people were negative about the market, the, the rate would go down. So LIBOR but, responds to the market much more instantaneously yeah. than the one year T bill or yes. I mean, the T bill. Ex exactly. So the idea here is that, I mean, to your point, Robert, that, that you know, everyone's really upset because they had interest-bearing accounts based on LIBOR, and they were keeping their rates artificially low. The agreement was, let's keep rates low to help ourselves. Well, and, okay, that's uh, where I know yeah. that's why the borrowers like LIBOR. Right. No, maybe lenders like it because it reacts faster, but borrowers liked it because it was a lower rate. It, it used to be lower. Of right. course, if it's LIBOR uh, plus eight percent, that ain't so good. Yes, yeah, yeah, so when things turn around, it goes up instantaneously as opposed to the T bill, which is lagging. So. Yeah, and then, and then the other thing that we I want to touch on real quick is that we do some work with them is J.P. Morgan. I mean, this trading issue uh, is huge. I mean, we don't know exactly how big the London whale is. Uh, we just know that J.P. Morgan came out this week and reported earnings and said, well, the $2 billion doesn't affect our balance sheet that significantly. I think their stock was up on Friday about $2, if you can imagine, even after reporting um, the loss. Uh, people say it could be much higher. It could be maybe 4 Six, uh, I think Bloomberg said today, seven and a half billion dollars. Uh, who won? You gotta remember these transactions, these derivative tra transactions are based on <coughs> two parties going against each other. You know, they called it like the big short in the book and all those things. Hedge funds were on the other side of this transaction and they made it out like bland bandits. They basically took this money from JP Morgan like wow. it was a layup. So, oh, uh, <laughs> it was a <laughs> good analogy. Yeah. <laughs> so, if, so, if the hedge funds would have gotten slaughtered, JP Morgan would have made a lot of money. Correct, correct. And I mean, it's it's hard for people to rationalize it. I mean, you know, we talked about this off the air a bit. What's going on when a, when a, when JP Morgan can play like a sports team? If a sports team can win and lose and have a significant impact, why is a bank doing that? That's our money. That's investors' money. They're supposed to lend it out, you know, like, like a, what's it, a wonderful life, right? That's, you know, <laughs> bring the money in, lend it out at a higher interest rate, and make your money. That's what banks are supposed to do. But now they're under such pressure to produce good returns. Uh, they go out there and they invest money in these risky derivative products that are you know, bound with problems. And, and it's not illegal to do it since the Glass-Spiegel uh, Act was uh, eviscerated yeah. Yeah. in the Clinton Didn't administration. Didn't you see the Correct. remake of It's a Wonderful Life, though? Because Jimmy Stewart goes there and goes, all right, Mr. Potter, I'm, I'm, come on, come on, seven. We go to roll the dice. Man, what a week for news, you know. On top of all that, we had the uh, Penn State uh, report that was released oh, yesterday. Yeah. That's, that's all the sports uh, stations we're talking about all Can day. Can you imagine how much it's going to cost Penn State? Well, if LIBOR is a problem, I mean, Penn State could be bankrupt. <laughs> I, mean, I, I don't, I mean. I have no idea. Yeah. I wonder yeah. if they're going to take the statue down. I, well, I mean, did you hear about Nike? Nike took down, he's, Joe Paterno is, uh, you know, had a, a statue up in front of a child care center. Oh, I know. I heard about that. Oh, and they no, took it down. Sure. So no. I heard that. I, I don't know if it was ESPN or someone said the other day. It was pretty scary stuff. But, yeah, I mean, the, the financial risk that we, you know, there's people locally in the Bay Area that made a lot of money suing uh, companies uh, like WorldCom and those other companies oh, that yeah. had the Enron, the malfeasance that occurred back then. This is another, you know, side of that. They, they, they go out there and, and make these problems, make these, make these rules for themselves. And that's what's really frustrating for everyone. In the end, they go... What's it going to cost us? In the end, it cost us $5 billion. So what? Pay the penalty. Yeah. We made well, 10. Well, well you said their, their, their <laughs> quarterly profits are huge, even taking into account the... But that's like, a, that's like an Aaron Brockovich type thing, right? The, right. The utility companies go, okay, well, I know about 50,000 people are going to die, but we're going to, you know, so we get sued for $100 million. We made $2 billion on it, so mm -hmm. let them die. So okay. what you're saying, it's been a really good week for attorneys. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's always, always a good week for attorneys. <laughs> and what did Shakespeare say? 
once you get in there, kill all the attorneys. <laughs> nice. <laughs> there, there's a specific reason for that. Wow, wow, wow. I can't believe digress that, but, but I, I mean, in, in the end, I, I'd still encourage everyone to, you know, stick through the election period, stick through these dicey, you know, returns we're seeing on, like, consumer price index, manufacturing indexes. Mm -hmm. Ignore all that stuff and just leave your money alone in the market for money you can afford to win or lose and stay with it. Well, well actually, Lou, we've we gotten an email uh, that seems like it's more up your line than anybody else's, so let me ask that one. Uh, okay. When we eventually go to break, when we come back, we'll ask the other emails. We got email that, time. That, that, yeah, Yay. we'll get into real email time, but since we're on the subject, anyway, uh, email comes in and asks, uh, I'm concerned about the stock market, but I would like to get income. Any suggestions? So I thought, okay, well, that's right up Lou's alley. Right, no, it, it, it's a great question. I mean, the, the struggle right now is what type of income will I receive and how much will it fluctuate? My, my original investment, if I put $10,000 in something and I'm getting a 7% a income return, like you can with some oil and gas partnerships, that's great, but you know, gas has fallen, or oil has fallen, gas has fallen over the last six weeks, eight weeks. Can I stomach, you know, I have some elderly clients, I've invested that money in oil and gas, I'm like, it's gonna go down, it's gonna go up, but you're gonna get your 7% rate of return. Regardless, so oil and gas is one high dividend producing stocks. I mentioned the last segment. If we get through this tax loop, this tax situation where uh, dividends are not taxed as ordinary income, they could be a nice place to be going forward. And some of these telecoms, uh, uh, oil and gas companies, um, not the explorers or drillers, but other companies are producing you know between a three and five percent dividend on their stocks. So I think there's plenty of opportunities. Plus, there are some bonds that pay a higher interest rate. I think everyone's leaning towards tax-free bonds right now, only for the main reason that tax policy won't affect them. Do you so like, they're very popular. Do you like preferred stocks? Uh, preferred stocks are very good. You got to be careful. I mean, preferred stocks are like a bond yeah. and a stock, and you have to just be careful where you position them in a portfolio and how liquid they are, um, how much trading goes on. But they, they can be a nice income rate of return. And the idea is that they, they don't appreciate. I mean, people buy those, they, well, they can appreciate much as seven or ten percent. If it goes up that much, it can go down that much as well. Yeah. But there, I mean, I think right now, I mean, banks offer you know some pretty good preferred stocks. Uh, even I, I'd like to see the auto companies come out with preferred stocks. Okay. Uh, or more of them, I should say, because they're my their their balance sheets are turning around. Now, for the listening audience who just heard all that great information, if they wanted to get a hold of you to ask more questions, how would they get a hold of you? Who are you and where? Yeah. Are you? <laughs> <laughs> Lou Botmall, 415-256-8970. Again, 256-8970. Or you can always email a question to Lewis, L-O-U-I-S, dot Botmall, B-A-T-M-A-L-E, at LPL.com. Very good. Okay, we're going to cut to our second commercial break. When we come back, we've got a couple of emails for Mark and Robert that you're not going to want to miss because I'm sure the listening audience, there are a lot of people out there who have the exact same question. So here is the second trivia question, and our theme is injuries in sports. In 1989, this Giants pitcher broke his arm while pitching due to cancer, which oh. he eventually had to have his arm amputated. Who is he? The first three callers with the correct answer win a free three-day, two-night stay at the Lighthouse Resort. Their website is lighthouseforfun.com. Call 888-912-1190. That's 888-912-1190 to answer this question. In 1989, this Giants pitcher broke his arm while pitching due to cancer, which he eventually had to have his arm amputated. Who is he? Call 888-912-1190. Make sure to include your name, email address, and remember to speak slowly and spell out your email for us one letter at a time. And we will be right back. <coughs> Everyone knows the I'm answer to that one? Dave Trebecki. Dave Trebecki. So, uh, email, do you want to well, you push this one? Yeah, let's push that to uh, next week. Okay. Then, How's the sound for Robert there? Uh, it's good. Did you bring a makeup? I need a little makeup because I got a little bit of Are we going to make up? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's always kiss and makeup. Kiss and makeup. There you go. You got my towel? Thank you. <laughs> wow, that, okay. hit, that hit the mic. Yeah. Anyone else need makeup? No, oh, thanks. We're good. You good? Oh, <laughs> All right. I like that. You like that? Yeah. Welcome back to the Best of Investing. I'm Edward Brown, your host, along with Mark Humph, Robert Schiff, and Lou Baumol. And when we cut to the second commercial break, we asked this trivia question. In 1989, this Giants pitcher broke his arm while pitching due to cancer, which he eventually had to have his arm amputated. Who is he? 
Douglas. Yeah, we all remember that one. Dave, Dave Drabecki, yeah. And I remember Will Clark running to the mound. And, you know, yeah, I saw that game. Oh, man, that was sad. I was, that was watching that, too. Mm-hmm. Yes. Oh, okay, uh, email time. Uh, Mark, we received a couple of emails for you. Uh, one was from a borrower, one was from a lender. Let's or, do the lender. Investor, so yeah, or investor, yes, yeah, we're, we're talking about lender. investments in the last segment. About that, so let's sure, go for sure. that one. Uh, I've heard you mention Deeds of Trust on the show. How come I can't buy one of those from my financial advisor? That's oh, a good question. yeah, that's a good question. So, um, well, we talk a lot about deeds of trust or trust deed investing on this show. Uh, my company, Pacific Private Money, uh, based in Novato, uh, we're a private money lender to the real estate community, and those loans are funded by private individuals who. Uh, receive a promissory note and a recorded deed of trust so it's a secured investment and they receive income from that note and it's a high yielding generally uh, income stream because we make loans generally anywhere from maybe nine to eleven percent and the investor who funds that note typically gets one percentage point below the note rate so if it's a ten percent loan um, they uh, the investor in that note oftentimes gets uh, would, would get 9% for the length of the term. And these are short-term notes, generally say 12 to 24 months. And um, the reason why you can't buy that from your financial advisor or your, or your broker is because these are in a class what's called alternative assets. These are um, investments that are not traded like stocks or preferreds or other types of um, uh, investment opportunities. They're not considered highly liquid and they're not traded publicly. These are um, private contracts uh, that are made up between the borrower uh, and the lender, the, the investor in the note. Um, it's arranged by a licensed real estate broker, which Pacific Private Money is. In fact, uh, we, we advertise um, uh, loans to the real estate investor community. Um, for example, uh, uh, we advertise to people who buy fix and flip and people who are buying rental property, et cetera, or people who own rental property and need to pull cash out. We, we market to that group. They come to us, they apply for a loan, we analyze their uh, application, we quote them a rate we think uh, will match up with our um, investor appetites. Yeah, and, well, well, let me interrupt so, you for a second because yeah. one of the things you know, when you mentioned it's illiquid, that never really bothered me because the loans that you do are you generally no more than three years. Right. So, you know, when They're people buy a, yeah, when people buy a, a CD for three years, they assume it's illiquid because they're going to hold it for that period of time. Also, Mark, you said that they were secured, and I, I don't know that people got clarification that they're secured by a, a, a deed of trust or a mortgage on a piece of real estate. Right. And, and a, a mortgage in California is actually referred to as a deed of trust. Um, in the United States, there are some states that are known as mortgage states and other states that are known as deed of trust states. In California, we secure a loan on a piece of real estate by recording a deed of trust. So um, uh, so we were talking last segment about uh, ways to invest your money for an income stream and uh, investing in um, notes uh, secured by deeds of trust, also called trust deed investing, is one way to achieve you know high interest levels of income. So let's say you invested in a 10% note that paid 9% monthly. It was a 12% note. Um, you would uh, a uh, first of all you get a chance to approve the borrower and the property. So you're not lending your money blindly. You get a chance to look at various. Uh, loan application opportunities. We put overviews together. I mean, pretty much everybody in this business does it uh, in a similar fashion. You look at a loan overview. If you like the overview, you ask for additional information. If it passes muster with you, um, you you know execute a funding commitment so that we know we can draw up the loan documents with your name as the lender and the borrower's name as the borrower. Um, when the borrower has signed the loan documents, you wire your money. You or your IRA or your trust, wh- however you're investing that money, would wire the funds to the title company and that money does not get distributed to the lender until to the borrower to the borrower sorry until that deed of trust is recorded there's insurance uh, title insurance uh, uh, lenders title policy insuring your lien position meaning we generally only do first deeds of trust first position liens on the real estate you get uh, hazard insurance where you're named as the lost payee in, in case the house burns down so it's it's insured and it's secured well the thing I, I thought it was really interesting is the interest rate so if they're earning nine oh, percent yeah. and it's paid on a monthly basis that's three quarters of a percent per month I mean right now you can't even get three quarters of a percent for a whole year annually, in a, yes. yeah, right. annually. so in one month you could make the same interest you'd make in a year 
When I first got into this business, the people who were my investors were generally people who were familiar with the real estate industry, like, you know, Robert, like guys like you, who were um, real estate agents, uh, commercial real estate agents and residential real estate agents who had, you know, saved their commissions up over the years, and they love to generally make uh, fund these loans because they understand real estate they can very quickly uh, analyze the you know the property and go oh yeah it's a it's a house in Marin of course I'll make a loan on that and we're only loaning generally no more than 65 percent of today's fair market value um, so uh, but more and more in the last couple of years all kinds of people have been calling us in fact you know my my investor list has grown considerably I mean it's it's an unbelievably large number uh, right now of people who have contacted me saying hey put me on your distribution list I'd really like to look at these funding opportunities and and uh, and what's that what that has created kind of in the in the um, private lending marketplace particularly here in the Bay Area is that um, uh, interest rates have actually trended down a little bit it, it, we used to loan out money at uh, you know 12 percent uh, and that's kind of trended down a little bit because there's now there's more money looking to fund those loans and you know competition makes pricing go down so now we're we're doing so, sometimes we're doing loans to uh, individuals uh, as low as uh, eight or nine percent which was unheard of in the private money or hard money lending world say ten years ago yeah but it's still a lot better than still it's eight eight percent rather than one eighth of a percent yeah exactly <laughs> and you know it's I mean you're basically the bank so you know people look right now and they say real estate's at a fairly low price point so whoever's making a loan of 65 percent on that new price point today is in a pretty safe position and you so probably, trusty, so you probably have a larger uh, clientele and it's going down because people realize how relatively secure that investment is compared to what it had been in the past yeah today it is a relatively secure investment if, if you believe that interest that, um, that real estate prices have generally corrected and you know yeah they may go down a little bit in some markets in the next year or two uh, still uh, but probably not the 25 to 30 to 50 percent drop that some markets had experienced and so just to kind of come full circle to the question um, trust deed investing is is an alternative asset class the only way to invest in a trustee secured note promissory note that would pay you say eight nine maybe even ten percent uh, monthly on your savings would be to go through a uh, licensed real estate broker who specializes in private money lending like Pacific Private Money. Well, you've had a great reputation and great uh, track record. So, how do people get a hold of you? Well, go to our website. Uh, we actually we have a new investor website up, separate from our borrower website. So, uh, I will give you that one. That is Pacific Private Investments. dot com. That's investments plural. So, go to Pacific Private Investments. dot com, or just call our office. We have a four one five number. We're here in the Bay Area. It's four one five eight eight three. 2150. Tell us that you heard it on uh, the best of investing. And you can always go to bestofinvesting.com and check us out, check Mark out there. And Robert, uh, here is an email that we got. That I know it's right up your alley. How much does my FICO score affect the interest rate the bank wants to charge me? That's a great question. Well, that is a good question. The FICO score could involve more than just the interest rate. At a certain point, it would involve uh, not being able to get a loan. Yeah. So um, the FICO score is, is the first thing we look at when we're looking at a loan. And um, there are different uh, um, banks that have different cutoff points, but at a certain point it becomes very difficult to get a loan. And I think that's one of the reasons uh, a lot of people had uh, short sales or foreclosures in the past and now their credit score is so low that they would have to go to people like Mark and get uh, hard money loans at a higher interest rate until they uh, spend a year or two clarifying and clearing up their, uh, their credit scores. Okay, and how, wh what kind of interest rates have you seen the credit scores get affecting? You know what I mean? Like, if you have a, a score of, uh, you know, 750, it's this interest rate. If you have a, a 650 score, it's that interest rate. Uh, it usually is in a narrow band as long as your credit score is somewhere in the mid to high 600s or higher. And if it's, uh, say, below 660 or 640, then it becomes more difficult, and it could it could result in a difference of uh, a quarter percent in an interest rate, as long as it it's uh, high enough to right. yeah, it could be significant. Now, at what at what um, at what score could you expect to be denied? Um, if it's in the uh, say below uh, mid 600s, you might be denied 
being able to get a loan. It also depends what the reason for the low credit score is. Is it that there was a foreclosure or a short sale or is it uh, overextending on credit and really have to look at it. And also, when people go to uh, mycreditscore.com and get their own credit report, it's not the same as uh, we get when we look at a credit report for... It's not uh, a true FICO score. It's, it's, it's a true FICO score, but it oh, it does, it's not as involved as uh, the, the credit reports we get for doing a mortgage. Oh, okay. And oh, so I've had people detail, say, oh, my credit right. score is 700. I go pull it and I say, well, it's, you know, it's in the low 600s and then... <laughs> oh, it's a big but, spread. But, but if it is, there's ways that we have uh, uh, companies or, uh, that can help them, help people repair their credit. And okay. sometimes that can be uh, uh, fairly significant and not take a long time. Well, every, and what will happen, it's kind of interesting because someone may have a low credit score for some, quote, silly reason. Uh, they can't get a loan, a bank loan, and then they're, but they're a perfect candidate for you, Mark. Oh, yeah, for a hard yeah. money loan. But yeah. then there's just a huge uh, difference, of course, between the bank loan they were hoping to get and then sure. probably the best rate I could get them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's the big okay. thing now. Yeah. Uh, Robert, you're quite the guru for mortgages. Uh, how do people, because you are a mortgage broker, people can refinance their homes with you, et cetera. How do people get hold of you? Uh, I'm at RPM Mortgage. Uh, you can check out our website. We're a very large uh, private mortgage bank uh, located uh, headquarters in the Bay Area. You can call me on my cell phone, which is always available at 415-515-1941. Or again, you can get to me through checking out the website for the best of investing. Very good, okay. We're gonna to cut to our third and final trivia question break. And here is the question. And this is a little bit more of kind of dumb sports injuries. <laughs> Which Washington Redskins quarterback sprained his neck when he celebrated by ramming his head into a padded <laughs> cement wall? He scored a touchdown. It was kind of a hard play, as I remember. Uh, and he uh, smashed his head against the uh, padded uh, wall and sprained his neck. The first three callers with the correct answer win a free three-day, two-night stay at the Lighthouse Resort. Their website is lighthouse4fun.com. Check them out. The weather's still great out there. Call 888 888- 912-1190. That's 888-912-1190 to answer this question. Which Washington Redskins quarterback sprained his neck when he celebrated by ramming his head into a padded cement wall? I've done that before. That's no fun. <laughs> uh, make sure to include your name, email address. Hello? Oh, yes. I'm sorry. I, I, I'm still reeling from the cement wall. <laughs> uh, okay. Email address. And remember to speak slowly and spell out your information for us, please, one letter at a time. And we'll be right back. I'm telling you, it should be illegal to have this much fun. Nice. <laughs> Gus Fraud. What, what is his That's name? right. Who? Uh, Gus Fraud? Oh, Gus I, you had some real estate stuff? Yeah. I got, well, I got this one right here, which is kind of a nice report on the uh, oh, value. Oh, gone up. The, uh, show, it to the, show it to the camera, though. That's, yeah. That's you focus on that? Here's the, uh, 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 the cost, monthly cost of renting versus owning. Right, so how do, you, how do you know real estate's overvalued and that's the bubble? So I don't want to say okay, that. Okay, I want to say it's a, a look yeah. So right now, yeah. renting is much higher than owning. Correct. That's the way if it I'm should be. It should book. always, renting should be always more than owning. Renting, which it should, it should, be, this should be. be. Yeah, it, should, it shouldn't be this high right now. Yeah. But on average, it should be. You I should think, make a I profit. I think that rent should be less than owning. Yeah. 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 Rent no, should be, be pro- if you're gonna if you're a real estate investor, do you want to make oh, money? Oh, 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 yeah, 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 I mean for owning your house. Owning for your house, yeah, yeah, for owning your house, yeah. But, but it's but an argument for year, buying. Yeah, right. in the last year and a half, I've had clients who have said, "Okay, my credit's cleared up. I'm ready to buy. I've been renting. The rent is going up now, mm-hmm. and they put down twenty percent, and they end up such that their monthly payment, owning the house with taxes and insurance, is less than the rent was." Yeah. Okay. Here we go. Welcome back to the Best of Investing. Again, I'm Edward Brown, your host, along with Mark Hunt, Robert Schiff, and Lou Botmall. When we cut to the third and final trivia question break, commercial, we ask this question. Which Washington Redskins quarterback sprained his neck when he celebrated by ramming his head into a padded cement wall? And Lou, you happen to know all these answers. Go ahead. It was Gus Farad. Gus Farad. That yes. is correct. Very good. And you have some kind of very, very interesting real estate uh, statistics for us. Well, we, you know, in the Bay Area, it, it is a different real estate market. I want to say that because it's our broadcast area. And there is a national um, tracking, you know, besides Case Shiller and other uh, 
indexes. There, there's actually one that J.P. Morgan does. It's re really interesting, and it really, it, in my opinion, tracks the value of real estate. What we need to understand is how much my real estate really worth. And, and, the, and the true answer is, from an investment standpoint, it's whatever you can rent your real estate for versus your holding cost. You have a traditional 80-20 mortgage. What's that cost you plus taxes, plus upkeep, plus insurance? So to measure that gap, JP Morgan takes what's the average rental rate across the nation versus the home mortgage rate across the nation. And I'll say this, in let's go back to a, a bad number. In 2006, okay, it was about $950 on average a month to own your home. To rent your same home, it was probably about $590. Okay. okay, this must be like some cornfield in Iowa. But no, go ahead. But no, I mean, this is this is based on averages. So think of it. Like, no, you, no, it's you, per you, week. Yeah, no, you, you, probably, you, you can't even <laughs> rent. You could average. For you could home. average it on on uh, maybe like a hundred thousand dollar mortgage. Remember, average okay. mortgages across the country are much lower than they are here. Sure. Um, so the, the, these are way of of quantifying the numbers. Now, currently, we're at the biggest gap we've seen in almost twenty years. Where on average, it, you you can rent a, a home for seven hundred nineteen dollars a month. And your average holding cost is five hundred and thirty-six. And seven hundred for renting isn't a huge amount. No. But in comparison, the the owning of the homes because the pr prices have gone down and the rates have come down. Correct. So, so that's saying that that if you have a house, you you would pay less owning it than you would if you had to rent it. Okay. Uh, Are absolutely. you considering the real estate tax breaks too, or do yeah, that, that, that taxes depreciation on investors or the home mortgage deduction. Okay, I wonder, uh, yeah. what, I wonder what uh, tax uh, bracket they're considering. I pretty low, and, and I guess the interest the, rate factors into that, right? Because yeah, because I'm looking. We're, sure. We were looking at that graph off the air, which of course our radio audience cannot see, but the graph shows literally the biggest gap um, in favor of home ownership going back 20 years, and I think it's you know kind of obvious. I mean, we, we rents have gone up like crazy everywhere, and yet the cost of home ownership right now, I mean, if you can buy a home, right, you can get a you know great interest rate and great pricing. And right. that, that, that's strictly a supply and demand with the renting, isn't it? It's I mean, a supply and demand with the renting. A lot of the people that are renting were homeowners who uh, lost put nothing down, right? lost their homes, and so there's a, a higher demand for a rental property. And, and, and fewer and people can qualify to buy. Robert's more of an expert on this than I am. But I think these are these are mortgages that average under the four hundred seventeen thousand dollar threshold. Yes. Yeah. So yes. Th th yes. those are really the low low rates. I mean, you have a high like we talked about FICO score. If you have a really good FICO score and you're you're refinancing under four hundred seventeen, you can get a great deal right now, right, Robert? Um, uh, it's it's just right. unbelievable. You yeah. can get a, a thirty year fixed mortgage for three and a half percent with no points. Did it go down again this week? Well, the it, ten, it, the it ten years at a buck and a half. Buck and a half. Buck yes, and a half. That, a, yeah. uh, and and, and there's not a lot of indication that it's uh, heading upward, especially this <laughs> well, year. It's a, it's a, not in an election year. No, and, unemployment and still probably high not and even after that. Well, it, it's scary to look, you know, from my from my world. I know it's a little different than yours, but both the the interest rate and the euro have dropped about the same amount this year. They're down about eight percent. Yes. Um, well, yeah, if you look at the, the pure yield, I'm not talking about the value of the bonds, but just the yield, how it's dropped so much. From 175 to 1.50, then you have the euros down at buck 22 right now. Well, partly, no you know, for uh, the United States, there's not too much else out there that's safe to invest, and so that's why a lot of money's coming in to dollars, right? Yeah, where else are you going to go? You're exactly. not gonna, you're going to buy Syrian bonds right now. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. <laughs> it's like when I took a plane, they said, yeah, we're going to do a stopover in Beirut. <laughs> no, no, I don't think so. <laughs> okay. Anything else, Mark? Well, no, I just, I, I'm just amazed that the, the, the mortgage rates keep dropping. And, you know, everyone I know who's in the mortgage loan business right now, all they're doing is refis, refi, right. refi, refi. And it's interesting that, you know, the, the, the home sales are, have really tightened up um, most recently because they're just, there's the inventory, uh, the banks aren't releasing as much inventory. We've talked about that uh, quite a bit in, in previous weeks. There's not a lot of new foreclosure or REO inventory hitting the market. And in terms of you know, retail sales, so many people are underwater that they just can't put their home on the market and sell it right now. So it's really, it's, it's, it's an interesting, um, interesting market we're in right now. Well, oddly enough, I think the percentage of sales that are short sales has decreased recently. So that, uh, I don't know if people are now above water and able to get out or, but uh, there's more people just selling their homes who had equity, but there's 
the, the amount of foreclosure sales and short sales is not as great as it was a year or two ago. Well, it, it although which is a healthy sign. We had a guest yeah. though. What it was last week that was telling us that he thought short sales were going to actually increase. That banks were starting to make it that the process of short selling streamlined. So again, you know, those of us who are real estate investors are hoping that that's true because we would really like to see more inventory on the market. Uh, <laughs> yeah, with with uh, Kamala Harris's uh, new uh, uh, money that she's got for California, that now the banks in California can't foreclose if the people are applying for modification. So that would oh, slow right. down that the just process. Came out. A lot of new regulations are going to muck things yeah. up yeah. even more. Yes. Yes. Any? Stay okay. tuned. <laughs> okay. Thoughts for the day. Remember, dyslexic learners are teeple poo. Don't forget. <laughs> and life is not measured by the number of breaths we take but by the moments that take our breath away. Oh, that's very Oh, brother, who yeah. wrote that savvy thought? <laughs> no, just kidding, I like that. That actually sounds... That is uh, nice. That sounds like something the Wizard of Oz would have told the Tin Man. A Zen moment on Best of Investing. That's yeah. right. <laughs> and with that, tune in next week to the Best of Investing. We're going to be giving away nine more free vacations for answering trivia questions. Thanks for listening. On behalf of our team, I'm Edward Brown, wishing you the best of investing. So long. Excellent. <clears throat>